All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome uh, to the first uh, virtual um, clinic that we are holding. We are excited for this. Um, thank you for taking time out of your evening and night uh, to join us tonight. Um, Kyle Bacon uh, is our guest uh, this evening who will be running through uh, the game film breakdown. Uh, just wanted to give a couple of tips. Please make sure uh, you're all muted. Um, we will have a Q&A at the end. Um, if you want to ask a question during, please use the chat box and um, we will get to those towards the end. Um, also, uh, thank you to um, the officials on the game, uh, Steve, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Steve, Javier, and Clifford. Um, this was the 1A state championship uh, boys game uh, from this past season. Um, so thank you to them. Uh, this is not an evaluation uh, of the game. Uh, hopefully this is a, a learning experience for them. Uh, Kyle will touch on it a little bit later. Um, but hopefully uh, they see this as a learning experience as well as everybody else. Um, and uh, without further ado, I am going to go ahead and play this little video that we have to introduce Kyle and then I'll turn it over to, to him uh, to get things rocking and rolling. All right, Kyle, uh, it is yours. I'm gonna take off my uh, share screen so Matt can get his uploaded and um, it, it is yours now. All right, hey, uh, thanks, Jeremy, I appreciate it. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, just wanna thank Jeremy and, and the Florida High School Athletic Association. Just a, an honor to be here, talk shop with everybody. Uh, you know, I'm a referee junkie, basketball junkie, and so, um, a little background, I uh, had the pleasure of meeting Jeremy last year in Spokane at the uh, National Association of Sports Officials, and we have some very good mutual friends in the state of New Mexico, and uh, kind of uh, precipitated this little, uh, um, you know, platform to do a little bit of training. Uh, we, we did it last week in New Mexico, and uh, it was it went really, really well, and uh, Jeremy just asked me to kind of duplicate it, and uh, uh, definitely happy to, and uh, keeps everything a little bit fresh. You know, this is a very uh, unprecedented time for all of us and uh, anything we can do to kind of stay involved. Uh, I commend each and every one that's on the call tonight. Uh, I know it's a Friday night, family, friends, and here we are talking basketball. Um, kind of something that Jeremy said too. Uh, I want to congratulate Steve, Javier, and Clifford. Uh, you know, a state final is something that uh, I've been very fortunate to do some pretty cool stuff in my career. and. Uh, um, I have just one state tournament, uh, state final game as well. So I, I know how much hard work goes into that and it, it, it's really special. So to you guys, congratulations. Uh, this exercise is, uh, you know, I just want to remind people it's not to, you know, not to hate on anybody, not to really blast anybody. Um, you know, film breakdown is, is for each and every one of us to get better and, and to get into it. And um, I'm pretty hard on myself with, when I do my film breakdowns or when I reach out to my mentors and, and we, uh, you know, get into that film, um, there's not a lot of pats on the back and this and that, um, you know, definitely, uh, at the end of the day though, you know, it's, um, you know, we always want to kind of critique people that, uh, have their video up on the screen. And even in our summer training, uh, one of my particular bosses is like, Hey, if you don't, you know, if you don't want your plays being critiqued and you don't want to be discussed, then, don't be on the big screen and, and don't do the big games and don't collect the, 
nice size paychecks. So, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things. It's a, a blessing and a little bit of a curse. So uh, with that going forward, I just want to, like I said, re uh, remind everybody that this is just a, a learning platform. And, you know, by all means, um, you know, I don't have all the answers, but uh, been doing this for, uh, you know, a decent amount of time. Uh, I think I'll be this fall, hopefully, if we start on time. Uh, I'll enter in my 20, 29th year of officiating and uh, 17th or 18th year at the Division One level. So I've been fortunate to, to be in this for a while. So um, with that being said, uh, Jeremy, you got anything else or we got uh, Matt to share the screen and kind of jump right in? Yes, sir. We can jump right into it. Okay, perfect. Matt, you on board? Great. Okay, so um, <clears throat> just starting right off, just, just play the jump ball, Matt. Um, okay, so, so first off, ball goes out of bounds here. Pause for me, Matt. Um, you know, it's a state championship game. Everybody's obviously a little bit excited, uh, you know, amped up. And then here we go. We throw a nice jump ball. Steve throws a good jump ball, gets swatted out of bounds. Uh, Clifford, you know, gives the ball to uh, Hawthorne. And it just, I don't know, it's, it's hard to hear with the audio. But uh, in a situation like this, I, like I said, I don't know if Clifford did or not. But just use a nice, loud voice. Pop that, yell it out. White ball, that way. Steve with his back to the play and Javier all the way across the floor can hear that and we can get situated rather quickly because I'm sure this is not the case, but it just looks a little bit like there's kind of some uncertainty or a, a little bit of like, what are we doing? What are we doing? And, you know, truthfully, as we all know that that's just not the way we kind of want to start off. We just want to start off sharp, ready to go, good toss, Ball gets swatted out of bounds. Good, strong mechanic by Clifford. Pointed. A little bit of confusion for Javier. So I'm only speculating. Hopefully it was just a nice, loud, bark it out, white ball. Gets situated. Uh, we'll jump forward to Matt. Let's go to just above 730, 732, 733. Back it up a little bit here. You can play it, pause it right about 734. So I just want to discuss, and this is, uh, you know, I don't know if you'll find this in any of your mechanics manuals or uh, uh, your rule books or this or that. It's more just of a philosophy that, uh, you know, I, I think if utilized properly, you can implement it in your game and it, it pays large dividends. I know when we're sitting in a locker room, uh, I always like to say that starting off a game, there's a lot of energy, a lot of excitement, and it doesn't have to be a state championship. It doesn't have to be high school, college, junior high, whatever the case may be at any level. There's just that, that pregame energy and just everybody's a little amped up. So with that being said, I always like to kind of, as a lasting thought for the crew before we go out there, talk about uh, withstand the ugly a little bit. In, in keeping in mind with that, there's a thing that I've often talked about is we have what I call the golden calls. First call of the game, first call of the second half, and our last call of the game. You can throw first call of the second period, first call of the third period in there as well. But really the first call of the game, first call of the second half, and last call of the game, those are our golden calls. And if the game allows it, we just want those to literally call themselves we don't want to have to roll the tape back three or four times and go, eh, was that a good call? Was that not a good call? So with that being said, utilizing that philosophy of going in and withstanding a little bit of ugly, sometimes it just takes a little bit of courage, a little bit of fortitude, just a little bit of patient, patience to let some of these plays kind of play out a little bit and go, ooh, ooh, should I put a whistle? Uh. And if we can take it right to that edge – a lot of times as the game goes forward, that literally that kinetic energy, that, you know, anticipation and excitement kind of settles in 
we settle in as a crew, the players settle in, and we can look up early in the game and the fouls are two to two and we're just kind of humming along. And so I, I just encourage people to kind of think about that as you go into some of your games and just kind of process that a little bit and say, you know, wait for a good one to come along. Now, with that being said, you may throw the ball up and five seconds into the game, somebody knocks somebody to the floor. A foul is a foul. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying if we can just wait for a really good one to start us off. So with that being said, here we go. We have it 730. Matt, if you want to play it, this is our golden call of the first period, first call of the game. Entry. Now, you know, on four, this is a one that's a little bit tough because he clearly, number five for Hilliard, clearly wraps number 10. And just position-wise, spatial, you know, spot on the floor, really the only person that can see this is our center official. And it's tough because this call actually, uh, and if I'm a little off with the Federation floor coverage, but this is really almost an out of primary call because uh, it call, comes from the center and is it, it's outside the lane line. And so it's kind of unfortunate. Now, however, I really like Clifford's cadence on the play. It's kind of one of those ones like he's looking at it. He has a very A look at it, wide open. And clearly number five kind of wraps. And literally we have the ball get kind of taken away too. So there is some discussion as far as possession consequence. So for a golden call, as much as I don't like to have a, out of primary, really at any time, especially the first call of the game, I think we got to get that call. So um, jumping a little bit forward, 713, Matt. Uh, actually, if, there you go. Perfect. So if you can back that up again real quick, Matt. This is kind of a coverage mechanics, fine-tuning some mechanics. So a little bit further, Matt, if you would. Now, I just want to watch our lead movement and rotation. I see this a lot. So when you're watching your game film, when you're watching films, you'll recognize this a lot. As the lead comes over, there's a terminology I use, don't back into a rotation. We have the lead official. When they hit that new lane line, there's like this turning of our back, and we back into a rotation. The problem with that is, is it closes your lanes of vision. You more or less, if you can, keep your shoulders parallel to the floor and have more of an open turning to the floor. So that's just a mechanics thing. I just, I encourage everybody to look for, identify that, try and tweak that a little bit so that our lane of vision is completely on the floor. Cause when you snap that body, you tend to cut your angles. Also on this one, you can see a, another coverage we're a little bit, uh, well, not a little bit, we're kind of slow in uh, with the rotation. Our old trail to new center. Clifford just doesn't quite pick it up. On those, you just want to keep in mind, trail to center, quick. Follow the speed and um, the kind of the cadence of your lead. Center to trail rotation can be a little bit slower. It's okay for us to have two centers. But on this one, we get a little bit caught out of uh, position as Javier comes over in the lead. Roll it forward, Matt. We can just see that our trail kind of stays in position a little bit long. And so that's one thing to identify as a crew early on in a game is just that floor coverage. Make sure we're a little bit tight and we're covering everything in our rotations. We don't have any gaps in our coverage. Uh, just roll it from here. Go ahead and roll it forward, Matt. I want us to look at the, the next foul that's going to take place at the other end, specifically personnel. We're going to see throughout this game, number one, the ball handler right here. He's going to get it back, and we're going to have an offensive foul, I believe. Here it comes right here. Mm. Actually, no, I, I apologize. Uh, back that up one second, Matt. Go to uh, 659. 
or a couple seconds. There you go. 658 is fine. Just play right here. This number one, uh, that's fine. We can – the number one, I saw him literally – we'll see throughout the course of this game, he has a tendency to every time a defender approaches him or gets close to him or when he drives to the basket, there is like a push-off and a leverage. Just pause it right here, Matt. Actually, while I'm talking, just back it up to like 645. So the number one – so that's a recognition thing. That number one, who's one of their prominent ball handlers for Hilliard, he really likes to lead with that off arm. So a little bit of preventative officiating would be for that number one. The first time you see him do that, you make a mental note and go, oh, okay. Now, if it's egregious enough, then you call an offensive foul. But I, it wasn't egregious enough in this sequence right here. But the first time he does it, you make a mental note. The second time he does it, if you can, you give him a verbal say, hey, don't be pushing off with that arm tonight. That'll, that'll get you some offensive fouls. So hopefully you can alleviate a potential couple fouls. Right there is one right – that's the play I was talking about. Right at about 703, 702 when he comes across. Number two kind of creates some separation away from him, the defender, and you go, whoa, how did that happen? So you just take a mental note because I don't think this is enough for an offensive foul. But you go, okay, one of my primary ball handlers likes to create some separation. Okay, so now play this forward, Matt. The next play we're going to have is at 640. Is a play that goes back to what I said about if we can withstand a little bit of the ugly patient whistle, you could jump to 640 right here. Okay, play that back. Ugly ain't always illegal. You know, we got some athletes out here. There is going to be some block shots. And if you look at this, you go, ooh, man, I, th I think maybe number 21 got a lot of ball. Ball, then body. If it's body ball, difference. Largely, maybe not completely vertical, but a lot of ball on that one. So we got to tell ourselves, okay, I I'm jumping a whistle a little bit. All right, we're good. But just got to keep in mind, if you look at that right there, we want to let those play on with the same consistency at the other end. We're going to let them block shots. If we can find and allow those block shots at both ends, we keep our better players on the floor. We get a good flow to the game. But this is just one to put – if you put whistle on this play, that's okay. We all do it. But you got to go, ooh, man, I think maybe if I could just held on for half a second longer – we can play out on this one. So now I want you to just keep in mind that's white number 21's first foul of the game. All right, jump ahead to 608, Matt. Hey, Kyle, while we wait for uh, Matt to do this, uh, sure. Frank Beasley, our basketball um, director, would like to ask you a question if you don't mind. Sure, yeah. Hey, can you hear me? I'm sorry. I'm yeah, I got having you, technical trouble. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, this is Frank Beasley from FHSA. Kyle, we appreciate you being here. I have a quick question. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things this crew got feedback on after the game was that uh, the evaluators felt like, or our, our people there that were watching the game felt like they didn't do a very good job or identify that, that I, I take that back, they did a good job. They didn't identify the best players at the beginning of the game or the, the major key players. Can you talk about how important that is to you uh, or if that is something that you think is important uh, in the beginning of the game, how important it is to identify? I, it just kind of uh, light bulb went off when you said identifying the key ball handler. Um, that yeah. was one of the things this crew got feedback on. Okay. And great, great question, Frank, and great point. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an important uh, – piece of what we do it once again at any level it doesn't matter but here's the thing is that you know we go out there we want to keep you know relatively 10 players two coaches relatively happy and one of the first things you can do to kind of get that little anxiety up with either one of these coaches is to put a couple fouls on a key player at either end that's one thing they'll it'll kind of get them a little bit They've got to change their game plan a little bit. They got to sub them out. So really, 
I'm not saying I'm not advocating like the Jordan rules where certain players, they just, they, they get that, you know, that extra, but the reality is, is a foul is a foul. But when it comes to one of your better players, for example, I think Hilliard uh, number, I believe it's number 35. I saw a little blurb at the beginning of the game. He signed a division one contract. So to me, yeah, that's like, that's okay. What I was, that's who I yeah. was asking about. <laughs> yeah. Number 35 is like, okay. And I'm, I'm going to, probably guessing this crew is somewhat aware they've worked some other some you know quarterfinals or sure. you know whatever on their way up so they're familiar with Hilliard they're familiar with Hawthorne but you do have a tendency to to know what your key players are and really I mean you know what I'll, I'll give you an analogy I had one of my early mentors years ago in my career and this is no disrespect to any of your six seventh eight nine tenth kids that come off the bench none whatsoever but here's the thing this person said to me one time, they said, you know what, you know, you're having a lunch and basketball is like burgers and fries. And I was like, what? Burgers and fries? Yeah. You sit down and you have lunch. You drop one of your French fries on the floor. Eh, you drop the fry. You drop another French fry on the floor. Eh, you know what? That's okay. You get a little frustrated. Drop another French fry on the floor. Yeah. Okay. If you drop your hamburger on the floor, your lunch is kind of compromised. It's a little bit ruined. So this official said to me, treat your starters like your hamburgers and your subs and your role players as kind of French fries. Now, once again, I'm not disrespecting if anybody's son or daughter is that fifth, sixth, or excuse me, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth player. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying is, is the fouls you put on your hamburgers, you want them to kind of call themselves, be high certainty, and the most you can minimize the – critiquing of those in a perfect world that doesn't always happen that way there's some tough calls that's why they pay us what they do to make some of these decisions however if you can kind of keep that philosophy in the back of your head that kill your number 35 uh hawthorne number 21 hawthorne number 10 they those are your players that you want to make sure those are kind of your hamburgers you just want to make sure high certainty high quality calls on those individuals. Hopefully that kind of makes sense. Now, the caveat being, you have to have that consistent application at both ends of the floor. If black 35 gets all this kind of consideration, but white 21 or white 10 don't, that's where you're gonna get yourself into some some problems. So I, I appreciate that, that answer your question, Frank? Absolutely, yes, thank you. Okay. So with that being in mind, I, I think as we go through this breakdown, you will see that, you know, there's just some instances where we need to, to have kind of that recognition about, mm, you know what, that's one to look at. Mm, that's one that put in the memory bank, you know, ooh, you know, and, and we'll see. It, and it's just, like I said, it's a philosophy as, the, as you kind of work uh, into some higher levels and stuff. The importance of that, it's, it's paramount to what you do because, if uh, if I go out on a game and it's a TV game and this and that where there's, you know, 14 different HD cameras and, and you're calling a, a, a foul on one of your marquee players, that's just that much more magnified. And same thing goes here. It, it's a state championship. And those calls are going to be critiqued that much more on your, your key players. So... Um, Let's see, 640, 608. Okay, so uh, Matt, can you back it up to about 6, 618 or 6, 620? It's a perfect segue for Frank, Frank's question because, um, okay, play it from right there. I want us to watch. Pause it for one second, Matt. Okay, we come up the floor right here, right there. Leave it right there. At 619, right in front of us as the center official, we've got White defending 35 for Hilliard. 35 being one of their key offensive components. So if you watch the, the defender from Hawthorne, he's, he's a little bit handsy. There's a little bit of impeding his progress. we got to be mindful of that. So if you play it forward a couple uh, frames, Matt, just watch the impede and the, the bodying up by zero. So they're banging a little bit. Okay, okay. I'm all right with that. We just, we got to be watching that. 
right here on the wing. He's kind of holding him, preventing him. Truthfully, you can put a whistle on zero right there when he tries to make his cut at the high elbow because there is an impede, and that disrupts the flow of the offense. I'm okay with the no call, though. But now with keeping in mind with that, you're aware of that. It starts with kind of some rerouting and an impeding of 35. Now just play it all the way out till we have the foul. 35 comes back to the elbow. They're running their offense. Now he's impede again and backdoor cut. And now we bang an offensive foul. So this to me is, is accumulation foul. There's a lot of illegal, borderline illegal defense by white zero. Impede, hold, reroute, impede, hold, hold. And then what we end up doing is, is we finally cap it off with an offensive foul against black 35. So when you go back and you look at this, like I said, it's kind of accumulation. I know what my boss would be asking that question, like, well, did you see what happened prior to that offensive foul? If we're going to end up calling an offensive foul, we probably could have put a defensive foul on white zero prior to that. So that's, that's an important piece to me, too, because it's like, okay, now I just put 35. I gave them a foul. They're one of our key players. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, Okay, go to uh, 537. Just want to look at, this is just a mechanics, a trail positioning thing here. Matt, can you back that up a little bit? I think one thing we can all do as officials over the last year or two, I know there's been a lot of emphasis um, in uh, at the collegiate level we talk about trail mentality sideline mentality i think that each and every one of us we could go through all our game films and watch our game films and you can identify several opportunities where we as a trail official we kind of get sucked into the floor if you go to that 28 foot mark sideline oriented that is a really really good place to officiate from the trail position because if we look at it here right about the 537 mark as the trail official we set ourselves up in a stack whereas if you just pause it there matt leave it there right for a second if right here if we go to that white line that literally is right underneath where the hawthorne the score bar that white line if we work right there trail mentality sideline oriented uh, i'm telling you that, that's, that's a really good position. You get a good panoramic view. You get good lanes of vision. If you find yourself working from that position a lot, you really will get a lot of really good looks. Um, and, and like I said, I, I have to constantly in my own video breakdown, just make sure that there's that consistency of, of trail positioning and sideline oriented. I'm not saying you can't move out onto the floor certain times, the play will dictate where you come out onto the floor. You get a good opportunistic look. But at the first opportunity to do so, try and get back to that sideline and back to that 28-foot mark because that's really some optimum viewing. Uh, Matt, 518. This is just a play here. Uh I, I don't know what our lead official had on this. I don't know if they had a travel or if they had an out of bounds or, or what they had. All I can see is just on the video here, me personally as a center official on this play, because right there is a perfect, perfect freeze frame, Matt. My look as the center official is completely closed here. I can't see the front side of what's going on there. It looks somewhat like a jump ball. Maybe there's a reach in. I think this is a, just a play that we say, just trust the system, trust the look of your partner. Don't put your nose in there when you don't need to. Just say, that's the leads play. They got the best look. And like I said, we don't know what the lead called on this, um, but our center official has a travel on this. Just be patient, lay off these, trust the system. 
So you can play that one forward. Matt, go to just above the five minute mark. Uh, Nate, do you, or excuse me, Nate, Jeremy, uh, Wilbur Clark has a question. Do you want to unmute him? Yes, I believe he was making a, a, a statement uh, from the 35 at the top of the key, but I will un unmute him so he can. Uh, oh, okay. I didn't know if he had a question or he just. Wilbur, did you have a question or are you just. Okay, that's fine. Let's move. Let's just keep it rolling. Um, all right, so back that up just uh, maybe about 512, Matt. So pause it right here. This is an interesting play here because I'd love to know the crew as far as awareness here. Right, pause it right there, perfect, Matt. So now we have a play at the basket. And so white number 21 for Hawthorne defends again. And if I'm watching this play, I'm like, Man, there's some there's some contact on the offensive uh, player, and it kind of spins them a little bit. I think that if you put a whistle on this play, it's it's defendable. It's it's a foul. Now, with what I talked about earlier, awareness, game awareness, we put an earlier foul on 21 at I believe 6:40. That we're like, ooh, you know what? Maybe it could have held off. So maybe that goes into the thought process here. Hard to speculate, but the kid takes the ball to the rack. Go ahead, play, Matt. Some lower body contact there, kind of spins that shooter. So that one, in a perfect world, if we can trade this play for the one that we called at 640, I think we can see that this is much more defendable, sells itself a little bit better if we could only go back and officiating and do that. But like I said, it's just more discussion, awareness. Okay, just play it forward. Go to the subsequent uh, inbound. I think it occurs right at the five minute mark, Matt. So now on this throw in, we're going to see some more holding, kind of some impeding of 35, potential illegal screen. So that's just something. We're three minutes into the game here, and we know we've already seen a trend that Hawthorne wants to disrupt and play aggressive defense on 35. That's fine. He's their best player. They should. But we have to have that awareness as the crew that watch out for that physicality, the impedes, the holding, grabbing 35. I'm not saying we could, we should have put a whistle on this one, but this is just another indication of that play earlier where we had the offensive foul, that their game plan is to kind of disrupt the 35, impede him, and really be somewhat physical with him. Physical is fine. Illegal, not so much. Uh, okay. Now just keep it rolling forward here. Inbound. We're going to see a play at the basket right here at 453. So pause it, Matt, before they show the replay. They will show a replay here. So this is a play, number 21 white again. Uh, you know, key player. On a play like this, it looks funky. It looks a little awkward. It looks a little bit, you know, whatever. But like I said, if, if we can have just a little bit of a patient with this patience on these whistles, have a little bit of fortitude, a little bit of discipline to kind of just hold off for a second and just kind of go, ooh, if I'm watching the defender, I ask myself, what is he doing wrong? What is he doing wrong? What is he doing wrong? Largely, he's vertical. There might be a re-reach, call that movement where you're vertical and then you reach and go back vertical, a re-reach, possibly. But with 21, patient whistle, let it play out a little bit. Ball goes in. I'd like to see a no call here. I don't think we'd get much pushback for the coach from – 
Hilliard, hey, why is that not an N1? If you do get pushback, you just say to the coach, coach, what did the defender do wrong? That, that's a, oftentimes a go-to line for me is like, if you are officiating the defense and you just go, what did they do wrong? And you can use that and go, you watch this from right here. It looks like, oh yeah, that's probably a foul. Now, if you just keep playing, show the replay. Keep playing. Here we go. Just watch 21. He slaps for the ball. He reaches for it. But he gets a lot of ball. So that's just one that with that ball going in like that, you know what? It's just an opportunity to, uh, you know, to just hold off on that one. Maybe save that for another one. Hands part of the ball. It takes some, like I said, it takes some courage and it takes some some really some discipline and patience to lay off this one. Uh, now, with that in mind, let's just say hypothetically, we don't put a whistle on this. We play on, ball goes in. Let's go to the other end of the floor at 437, Matt. Back that up a little bit and play. So now if we watch this, Somewhat different, but I love the no call here. Block shot out of bounds. Defender, airborne defender, contests. So like I said, hypothetical, we have that no call at the other end. If we would have had the no call, then we follow it up with this one. Block shot out of bounds. It just allows for a little bit smoother flow, smoother transition. Food for thought. Uh, 424. Jump ahead a little bit. Excuse me one second. Here's a play. I think that Lee does a nice job just to clean up foul. Point of emphasis. Maybe during a dead ball, somebody said something about, hey, watch the physicality on white, or excuse me, on 35. This is a play I'm kind of talking about where. They've been bodying him up, a little bit of a some physicality, a little bit of a wrap there. Good cleanup foul, good first foul. I like that one. It, it, it just it says to White that, hey, we're not going to let you do this all night long. You still got to play good legal defense. 407. Just a slight little mechanic tweak. Javier, good, good offensive foul, like it. The only thing I would just tell you is just keep that head in there, don't turn that head. Players going to the floor kind of hard like that. You just want to make sure that, you know, in a more uh, contested game, somebody doesn't say something to somebody or, you know, there's that little flare up. So yeah, good offensive foul. Just kind of keep that head in there, punch but keep your eyes on the players. All right, 326, Matt, or 330, started at 330, roll from 330 to about 315. This is another sequence. Just want us to look and see how in the perfect world if we play this out. 326, 10, drives, block shot, Flails on the floor. Sorry, I got nothing for you. Now we come to the other end. Takes it to the hole. Does big boy in the middle of the key kind of reach up there? Yeah, he does. Sure. But if you have that in-game awareness where you just say to yourself as a crew, hey, we just no called down here. Let's make sure. We don't have a, you know, let's not have an easy one at this other end. Let him defend. 35, he reaches up. But once again, just a philosophy thing. I think if you just eat that whistle a little bit, let him take it to the rack. Patient whistle. Process the play. Ball goes in. Maybe lay off this one. Two no calls at both ends of the floor. 
they just seem to, what we say terminology, they bookend a little bit more convenient. It just looks like, wow, that consistency, block shot, block shot, boom, boom, boom. But when we have the one at the other end where the kid kind of flails to the floor and this and that, and then we have this one, I'm not saying he doesn't make contact. I'm just asking, is it enough? Can you have the courage and a little bit of the discipline to go, oh? I think they show a, a replay from the end line, if I'm not mistaken, Matt. Just let it play out. I can't remember if they do or don't. Yeah, here it is. So like I said, number one for Hilliard, gets the ball away pretty clean. Ball's clearly away when White 35 reaches up there and taps that shooting arm. So like I said, I'm not saying there's not contact there. I'm just saying that's where it take you to the next level. Have a little bit of this, just like I said, that patience and, and discipline to go, uh, can I, okay, play on. And I, I just think that's a type of play that I don't know if you would get much pushback from that coach about, hey, how come we don't get the N1? Especially after you just had the no call at the other end. Uh, just stop it at about 241, Matt, and play it for a couple seconds. This is just an optics thing, just a mechanics thing. When you're watching your film, for any of us, I try and identify some little body language, body cues. Clifford, I just wanted to watch here in the sea, just your hands, kind of swinging our hands, just kind of, it's just an optics thing. But I would, it's almost casual, like, oh, uh, this is easy. Oh, uh, this is, you know, and I mean, if that's one of your things where we do to, to relax or, or to just, you know, create that poise, just be aware that some might misperceive that as kind of like casual and, you know, not dialed in. Just watch for it in your other films. If you get some other film work or for other people, just watch for those little nonverbal cues. Uh, go to 114, Matt. Actually, uh, can you back it up to the previous possession? Go about 130. Yep, go ahead. Just play it. Just want to watch here. Everybody can watch. Hawthorne defending, if I'm not mistaken. I think there's a couple block shots. Or no, not block shots, but 35 is just getting defended, defended. Shot gets contested. Got rebound. Shot contested. I love it. Good no calls. Let them play out. Let them play out. Now we come down. 10 takes to the hole. 35 takes a pretty good swipe at it. I'm not saying it's not a foul. I'm just saying the cadence as the as I can't really tell if the lead has a quick cadence, but center official, pretty quick cadence on that. Swipes at the ball. It's almost like sometimes I talk about when we have a, a sequence of plays where, oh, wow, block shot. Oh, wow, block shot. Oh, wow, block shot. It's almost like the anxiety of the play kind of creeps up on us and the air starts to come up and we kind of feel that. So then what happens is whether we go down to the other end or we have another shot at the same end and we'll put a whistle on a play that's like, oh, I think this is one right here where I don't, can't speak for them, but maybe there was a little bit of an anxiety buildup from the other end. And then we come down here, 35 makes a contest at the bat, at the ball. We put a whistle on it. Kind of maybe looks like a foul. Mm, but this is, to me, is another similar one. Back to the play at uh, 317, where big number 35 reaches up and taps, and we have the N1. This is kind of similar here, whereas, and maybe that's, we put whistles on both of them. Okay. Another school of thought would be is just we let both of these play out because this one stings a little more because who is it? Black number 35. Now he's got two fouls with a minute to go in the first period. And we're looking at this one going, 
Does he get him? Does he not get him? Does he get him? So play it out. I think they show a replay map from the end line view. So, like I said, it's, you know, some people might say, that's a foul. Me, I'm probably going to have that, like I said, that little bit of fortitude just to lay off that one. Coach might get on you a little bit and say, hey, that's a foul. Coach, I got a lot of ball there. That's a lot of ball. And that hand, that's part of the ball. You know, with the mindset being that I'm not going to put 35-second foul on that particular play. He may give you another opportunity, but not that one. Just my, that's just my opinion. Uh, go to 47.8. Back it up a little bit here. Just, just the optics cosmetic thing. If it's clearly not your play, I would just say this. Javier, just be careful in the center official giving too much information. And the only reason I say that is I've done things like this in my career and it's come back and bit me in the butt because I just was trying to be a little bit over helpful. Just be careful with that. Now, if you have a partner that pops their hand, help, help partner, help, by all means. All right, 14.9. There we go, our friend number one. I don't know if any one of us, we're all in actually pretty good position. I look at coverage position-wise, centers, free throw line extended, trails just above 28 foot mark, lead is lane line pinch, kind of tough. But I tell you what, either that defender embellishes the heck out of this or number one, who's a culprit for the previous eight minutes, He's tend to push off like that. So with that going forward into the, the period break, we can just jump forward. Go to 750 of the second. And just pause it. So we have our end of the first period. Hard to say what we discussed. Back it up a little bit, Matt. So, you know, Steve being the crew chief, a couple things to talk about. I think, hey guys, you know, uh, Hilliard, number 35, he has two fouls. Hawthorne, number 21, has got two fouls. Let's just be mindful of those. Make sure three, four, and five are good. Also, let's keep in mind that black number one, every time he gets the ball in the front court set, he has a tendency to create separation with the defender. Let's just be in a good position to be able to look through and see if he creates some space because um, he's going to get an offensive foul. Uh, if you haven't already, you tell him, you know, hey, number one, stop pushing off. You're going to get some offensive fouls if you continue to do that. Just a little bit of preventative officiating. You know, some might say, hey, don't coach the kid. I don't know if that's necessarily coaching. It's just saying, hey, that's an illegal action. We're going to call that if you continue to do it. Um, so that's just some of the things that I think are the high points in terms of a period discussion. Let's just make sure that these are uh, areas of high awareness. Um, and then we come out of the, so we come out of that period, we start up the second period, and then we have this goofy little out of bounds play here. Roll it forward, Matt. I think right here, the, I don't know what number it is, but the, the Hilliard kid, as we can see, um, he's clearly out of bounds, and I think he touches the ball. So right, wrong, or indifferent, I don't know. Maybe we did get it or we didn't. But the optics of this look like, who? it looks like there was a little bit of dip in our concentration. And that's something that all of us, myself included, I try to coach myself out of, whether it's coming out of a period break, whether it's coming out of an intermission between the second and third period, whether it's we have a, a player goes down with an injury and so there's kind of a lengthy delay or we have water on the floor, whatever there is a kind of a lengthier disruption. Also timeouts, coming out of timeouts, is that we got to bring that 
that awareness and that focus back up because what will happen is we come out of that, uh, that time frame and then something quirky like this will happen. And what it says is maybe there's this perception of just a, a little bit of a lapse of focus and concentration. And this is a perfect example. We have this kind of little goofy out of bounds play. Um, 7.36, just want to identify good no call by the crew here. Takes it in, defends. I like that. This is the second time number 10 likes to find himself on the floor. So I make a mental note. Ah, okay. He likes to put himself to the floor and try and get us to, to bite on that whistle. I like it. Good no call. Start off the period. Waiting for a golden whistle, so to speak. Uh, 718. So now we go to 718. A lot of, lot of maneuvering, a lot of spinning, weaving by zero. Sweet move, actually. I mean, give the kid credit. Number two, number 22 goes up to defend. Not quite vertical. Contests the ball. There is quite a bit of verticality there. And then the ball goes in. So, like I said, keeping in mind that withstand the ugly type philosophy, I'm not saying – we don't put a whistle on this, but I'm just saying if you just be a little bit more patient and you look at this and you go, can I get away with a no call on this? Ball goes in, play on. It might just lend itself to a little bit more of a, of a free flow. I think they show a replay. I'm not sure, Matt. It's a nice little move by zero. I'm not saying it's not a foul. Don't misconstrue what I say because he clearly comes across and he is not vertical. But like I said, sometimes I just ask myself, can I get away with a no call on that one? And can we play on? I watch this play. I, th I think it's defendable. It's a foul. But like I said, I like to take it to the edge of the envelope and go, man, can we get away with a no, no call on that one? Just food for thought. Now, like I says, if you no call this one, you got to be highly aware as a crew that if we go down to the other end and we have a play contested at the basket and there's that similar type of contact and stuff, we got to be consistent. It's a fine line too, because if you no call that and then it, the physicality goes a little bit further, you got to have that, that awareness and that experience to go, okay, too much. We got to put whistles on them. Hey, hey Kyle, real quick. Yep, absolutely. One question. Is it right that we are not bothered by late whistle yelled if the ball doesn't go in? Just a real quick question here. Say that again. Is it right that we are not bothered by late whistles yelled if the ball go doesn't go in? Um, uh, I mean, throughout my career, if uh, a player – or a coach is like, Ooh, wow, that was late. Usually my typical response is it was right though. Right. And I just put it right back to him, you know, because I, and I've said many, many times to a player or coach be like, Hey coach, I'm, I have a patient whistle guilty as charged, but that allows for better accuracy for me. And I don't think there's any now, <laughs> Uh, late is a subjective term. I mean, you can't be like, oh, the ball's rolling around, rolling around, rolling around, comes out. Now we come up with – no, that's – I'm not saying none of the manipulation, that's a whole other conversation, but you've got to be mindful of that and be careful of that. And once again, a foul is a foul. This last play right here, I think it's defendable as a foul. He reaches like this. He's not even close to verticality. But I could say – yeah, he reached across. Man, he got a lot of ball. And like I said, I literally, my self-talk in that play, if I'm in the lead, I go, ooh, can I get away with a no call? And then if ball goes in, I'll go, ah, play on. You know, and like I said, that's a fine line. But then you've got to apply that same principle at the other end for the sake of consistency. 
and it has to not just be me that applies that consistency. It has to be the whole crew. Back to your question though. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's okay if it's a half a second late, if it's a foul, it's a foul. Now the ball going in is not the determining factor of whether or not you call a foul. It just, when the ball does go in, it just, just allows you a little bit more flexibility for the sake of it goes in and we play on. And then there's that free flowing game. Ball goes in at the other end. Boom. We come back. Like I said, I just, from, from experience of doing it, I just, sometimes we find ourselves in a much better flow if we don't have all those, you know, that choppiness and the end ones and stuff. Thank you, Mark. I hope that uh, answered your question there. Uh, Kyle, uh, go for it. It's all yours, man. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, let's see. Um, wrote down. Can you, uh, Matt, can you back it up about uh, 720 and change? Just back it up on Steve's call. Okay, yeah, play it right here. Uh, that's okay. Uh, I'm sorry, everybody. Uh, go to, let's go to like 657 and play it out. We're going to have a sequence that I like to, I, I think it's a, a good bookend. Here we go. Perfect. 654, number 10, run out, takes it to the rack, a little bit of rubbing, a little bit of bumping. Ooh, no call. Got away with the no call. Ooh, let that one go. Good. Playing out. We're having the discipline. We don't let the little bit of anxiety. 35 diving for the ball. I just, that right there, that just shows, that's just good patience. That to me is a perfect definition, that whole sequence right there where we withstand a little bit of that ugly. We're just like, ooh, ooh, ha, ah, ooh, ooh. That's, we're not visibly doing that, but in our head, we're going, whoo, whoo, ha, whoo, you know, all these block shots, crazy kind of plays. I think one, there's a lot of verticality on that first initial shot. It looks a little funky, but number 10 has been on the floor every time he takes it to the basket. So I actually personally like the no call. And we jump ahead to 546. Yeah, right here. 35. I don't know if it was recognition. I'm going to give the crew props. Don't want to put a whistle on this play. 35, that would be a third foul. A lot of verticality there by him as a defender. Good recognition. I like that. Good no call. Play on, baby. Okay, jump ahead. 508 to 504. Just a little mechanic. Mechanic style log, coverage. Just want to talk back to our trail position, 508 to 504. So um, so right here, Javier comes over in the lead. Can you back it up again, Matt? Stop it right at about uh, good center position. Stop it right there, 510. Okay, so right here at 511, just stop right there. because. Steve, you're right on the 28 foot mark. You're right off the, just the side of the, the left hand of your uh, dribbler, your ball handler. You're sideline oriented. You're absolutely in ideal position. And what we do is, is we go from 508 to about 504 on the time. And we see ourselves. we walk right into a stack. Now, Number one is not up tight on the on the ball handler, so it doesn't really hurt us. But it's just one of those things that I want to identify when I'm watching my film. It's like, why did I give up that open look? Because in another game, you know, 95 out of times out of 100, it doesn't hurt you. But it's those five times that the defender is a little bit too close, reaches in, hits, or if you have a kid, pulls up like a Steph Curry, fires a shot away and we're stacked on that and you can't see the point of contact. So on those, those would one, I, if I'm watching my own film, I'm like, why did I move right behind number two? Why didn't I just stay 
sideline oriented, be able to look to the defender and also look beyond the defender into the horizon, because then you can also come and see if you can see somebody come coming up to set an on ball screen. Um, 351, Matt, to 345. Just play it out right here. This is just a discussion for our, our lead mechanics. Pause it. So, so right here, I think right when the kid starts to cross the half court line, we as the lead official, this is where we talk about mirroring the ball. And when we see that kid cross half court and he has a, he's already has a, He's starting to go, he's coming towards that Mountain Dew logo. That's where myself, if I'm in the lead, I want to be at the, the lane line ready to facilitate that rotation. A couple dribbles later, a couple frames forward, Matt. Now we're going as the lead. The center official can recognize that move top side up. A couple frames forward. Good. Just be careful. Uh, can you pause that right back there, Matt, at about 347? This is one thing. Just, just be mindful of our positioning here because we're in a very closed off look as the trail. We have our body completely turned towards the on-ball matchup, which that's our primary. However, if you can back up a little bit and look through that rather than turning and looking, because you cut you cut off everything so all you can do is really cover the on ball matchup whereas if you come and go outside in look you can see what's coming i think this kid pulls up 35 pulls up pops a 3 play it yep also on this one too we kind of we find ourselves in somewhat of a stack if that uh if we have an elbow hit, I don't know if we'll see it because we're kind of stacked on it. This is one where I, I love to talk about sideline oriented, 28 foot mark. This is one where when he's that right-handed shooter, you may have to come out onto the floor one or two steps, jab step hard, get the point of contact, look at the elbow. When the shot's clear, then you step back to the 28 foot sideline mark, go to rebounding responsibilities. Um, 248, just another little mechanical tweak for any of us. Catch yourself doing this. Watch when the ball goes out of bounds, our lead. Instead of, boom, popping our whistle and pointing with our right hand, where we close off ourselves to quite a few of the players, take a step one, two wide and point, uh, raise your hand. Federation mechanic and point with your left hand. That way you keep your body, you keep a panoramic view of all the players. And like I said, we can all catch ourselves doing that. 240, a couple frames forward, just play it forward, Matt. This is one where I just watch my own films. Same for everybody on this one. Go back to about 243 and just freeze frame. I want us to look at the center positioning right here. Okay. We're in the center position. Great open look. Great open look. On ball defender. It's a very competitive matchup. He's right up in his grill. So if I have this and I'm right there and my lead is coming, that's okay. This is one where our trail Steve, just aggressively move to the front, or excuse me, aggressively move to C. Lead's coming over, no problem. But as the center, I don't want to be moving when I got this great open look. It'll play out enough that I can, now when he spins back and drives, that's when you can kind of step up and go to trail position. But the initial catch, when the on-ball defender's right there, just hold that position. Great, great open look. Just be careful to vacate open looks. Uh, go to two, 211, Matt.
Okay, this one, just a coverage thing here. Freeze frame, freeze. If we go back to about 206, 207, this is where we got to recognize as a crew, we got to be careful, take a peek, whether it's the trailer or the sea, and just say to ourselves, we're dual coverage. We're both kind of refereeing the ball here. We're refereeing number five. So this one is, if I'm the center bench side, I just want to make sure that I'm responsible for the players near me, or we should have the lead, maybe initiate a rotation, because that ball is up there in the corner. Or this is an instance where even as a center, you might be able to initiate a rotation. Because that's a high sideline area, 35. This is, just keep playing this. This is one. 10 takes it up. Okay. Go the other way. A little bit of confusion, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. And just play it. I think, uh, yeah, Javier comes in, I believe. Is that right? Discussion ensues. 10 blocks it out of bounds. With the replays and everything, it's kind of hard to tell like what the, how long the discussion or whatever. I don't know on those. I, I love the switch. You just come in, you can pause it, Matt. Just come in, Javier just comes in. And he says, literally what your verbiage is, is, hey, Clifford, I got the number 10 blocking it out of bounds. That's all you say. Just leave it at that. And then if for whatever reason, you know, we'll see another play in the second half where we have an out of bounds uh, play with some help. Um, 96 times out of 100, somebody comes to me with help. I'm taking their help because as the outside official, when you come with uh, information on an out of bounds help, you are taking ownership of the play. Okay. 128. Uh, 128 and 120. I think this is a, another example of some great sequencing. No call followed by a no call. Got a lot of verticality, good defense. Goes to the other end, contests the ball, no call. Good, good. Okay, 25 seconds to go. Twenty-five seconds is just a discussion here. Just catch ourselves. We make this call. Guess who? Number one, offensive foul. Now, the only thing I just would like to tweak a little bit is a little bit more sense of urgency with a C to C transition. My philosophy when I'm out there working in the C is much like we always talk about when you hustle to the new lead position, you'd like to be set up and stationary for uh, to like accept the play. I try and use a very similarly similar philosophy with a center to center transition. So I'm free throw line extended and the play is actually kind of coming towards me rather than playing catch up. This is one where I just, I'd like to see a little, little bit quicker transition and the believability position wise would be a little bit better on this offensive foul. But here we go again. Number one, push off. Number two goes flying. Whoop. Good call. He has a tendency to do that every single time. He knows it too. Okay. Right, Kyle, John, uh, John Decker, you have a question or a comment. I'm going to allow you to talk. So if you want to, to ask, go for it. Just unmute yourself if you want to go, John. Go ahead, Kyle. Never mind. 
Okay. Yeah, John can type it in the in the chat box, and then if you want to come back around to it, um, just go to the end of the period. Matt, score, no score. Slip play. I, I mean, tough little play right here at the end. You know, 35 kind of slides in, but I, I think the 10 does enough of a slip. I like the no call. Now, the only thing is, is with all that going on, all I would say is for a crew, and this is, this is a question that I got to be careful of because from a mechanics and coverage, federation, college, they're, I believe they're different is who has less second, excuse me, last second shot responsibilities is you just got to make sure that we, we don't want to project that uncertainty or like dissension of like, well, do we count it? Do we not count it? Just make sure we know who has that last second shot. Just be real strong, clear with your signal, count it. And then on this, we want to make sure that stay with the players until they clear. Clifford does a really, really good job of staying with these players all the way to the end because we have a subsequent technical foul. Just keep it playing, keep it playing. So we have a, I like the decision what the crew did on this play too. We have a double technical. When they show the replay, just some, just some good ball, dead ball officiating. Number 35 gets up. One pulls him up. He did a good job of making it look like it was unintentional, but I think it was intentional. And then I just like the decision we made as a crew to penalize both. But Clifford, good job. Steve, just a little bit of awareness. Make sure when those players are crossing like that, we have to have that high awareness. Anytime players hit the floor too like that, just be a little bit more sensitive to a possible, uh, you know, some chipping going on. That's a good message sender too going into halftime that, hey, we're not going to allow that little bit of chippiness. Okay. Okay. Um, let's go to third period, 734. Just food for thought. We come out, first call of third, or excuse me, first call of second half, third period. We have a cap. Defense play. Okay. So going back, it's just one of those ones. Just we have a long break. We have the intermission. We have the, the halftime. We come out. We have to reset, kind of recalibrate that, that focus, patient whistle, come out reset that mindset of, okay, withstand a little bit of ugly. Let's let them kind of find their flow. And then we have this as our first golden call. I think they'll show the replay. And that's also White 21's third foul, 26 seconds into the second half. It looks funky. It looks a little ugly. But if you just have that little fortitude, and like I said, that little bit of a just discipline to go, oh, can I no call that? See that hand 
part of the ball there. Like I said, if earlier in the game we collectively as a crew, we established that we're going to allow those block shots and stuff, these are easier and more sellable. So, and like you said, that's just – that's a – Philosophical discussion. Okay. 641 of third. Boom. Good no call. I like that. Just keep playing. Play it out. What's the time on this, Matt? We jump forward a little bit. 641, we should have a – okay, yeah. We have an out-of-bounds here at the other end. This is a, a goofy little play, and, and it, I, I, I don't know what the, the context or the, the conversation is. But it's it's just tough to to guess. But the optics of it look very like we're in really disagreement. We come in, trail comes in to offer some help, and this and that. I don't know the specifics of the conversation. I don't know how it goes, but it's like it was a very lengthy chat and dialogue. All I would say on that is just expedite that a little bit quicker, Javier. If you're going to come in and offer information, just be like, hey, I. I I got it off, uh, you know, such and such player. And then Steve just go, okay, thanks. I got you. We'll talk about it later. Boom. And then just like that. Cause it's like, it just, it, it looks a little choppy and like, like we're disagreeing or this or that. So just all I can say is without knowing the specifics of the conversation, just boom, just, just make that a little bit shorter. 633. So now here's, a play where I talk about just a what I call scar tissue. We have this play where I go in as Javier, I offer some help on the out of bounds. Steve decides to stay with the original call. And so now uh, in my head, I'm going, oh man, did I give him the, did I not present the information correctly on the out of bounds? Should I have said this? Should I, da, 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 whatever the case may be, but you have all that chatter going on in your head. And so now we run down to the, to the new lead. And I, I call it scar tissue because we have this distraction, this self-talk distraction. And now we have this play and we play this play. It looks funky, it looks a little awkward, but that, that like I said, I believe I'm speculating that that little bit of scar tissue and that little bit of distraction about the out of bounds sequence we just had we we end up putting a fourth foul on white 21 at 633 to go in the third so he's kind of a key player and on this one I don't think anybody says anything to you on this 633 we come away with a travel it's just a funky looking play but especially on a funky looking play. I just want to be very hesitant to put a fourth foul on somewhat of a key player. And then that makes you go back and, or if you're a coach and you go back and you look at a tape and go, man, what happened? And you go back and this is where we get ourselves in trouble. At my level is, is a coach will have somebody that sits on the 10 seats down on the bench and their job is to go and clip all the plays that was, uh, number 21 and they send in all these plays and then my boss is calling me going can we can we explain these plays you know they're on the bench at such and such time and you know explain those to me so that's why I say that there's you know back to the uh, Frank's question it's just like just identifying really and being precise with some of those whistles uh, oh Matt can you back it up to after this foul we just want to be aware of the dead ball stuff, much like going into the halftime. When 21, right here, play it. After we call the foul, you don't need to show the play. But when uh, 21 leaves the floor, watch what he does to the free throw shooter. 
He's walking. He's walking. And didn't happen. Nothing happened. 22 didn't say anything to him. But we just want to be aware of that. He knows he's there. So just an opportunity for us is dead ball officiating. You know, 21's already frustrated. So you got to be very precise with what you say to him. Say, hey, 21, work with me now. Come on, come on, work with me. Because he already is, doesn't, nothing we say is going to make him happy. He's got four fouls. He's got to go sit out. But at minimum, we're trying to prevent him from doing something. 22 retaliates, says something back to him. And now 21 says something back to him. And in the heat of the moment, pa pow, we give him a double technical. Guess what? 21's got his fifth foul. He's out of the game. So. All right, 4.34, Matt. Boom. Okay, I believe 4.34, we're going to have a double whistle here. I would just say on this one, uh, I can't – excuse me one sec. Play that one more time, Matt. I don't think uh, outside of my screen frame, but can't see what the, the lead official on this one. I would just say center official, just a little bit slower cadence, just a little bit more patient. If the lead doesn't pop this one, go ahead, come and get it. But just a patient whistle on this one. Don't Don't be so aggressive on it. And that's just a coverage thing if, in fact – because number 10 comes from strong side lane line across the lane to defend. So that would be our leads defender. I would be more apt as a center official just to take a step or two or three steps in just to calm the situation so nobody gets upset, hard foul. 357, Matt. This is just a transitional screen play. Kid just gets blown up. Boom. And then we have a potential block charge. All I'm going to say on this is I would – I often say that we want to be not so focused on the tree that we don't see the forest. This is one of those plays where some people say, make sure have awareness of the horizon. I'm just speculating here, but as I look at Steve, I think he's pretty dialed in on that defender, white number two defender, and we don't have a whistle on this play. Now, I'll give credit to the center official. Javier is doing a pretty good job of assisting on this, and if he thought it's illegal, I think he probably would have came in and got this. But as the trail, I want to have a little bit of awareness of this too when this screen blows up because – for my own sake, if I have a play blow up like this, oftentimes I will just instinctively and based on experience, I will ship this an offensive foul. But I really think – I think this kid sets a legal screen. So as the trail, I think we got a little bit lucky in not having a whistle. And I would just like to see a little bit more awareness, I, I guess, from lack of better terms, of the horizon and what's coming – because I've had enough of these plays blow up on me in my career that I've missed them. Yeah, this kid gets rocked. Uh, 326, Matt. Whew, man. <laughs> Good old number one, almost picking up another offensive foul, too. Boy. 326 is just another play, just food for thought. Think about, man, could we have a – just a play, patient whistle, kind of a theme throughout. Just some of these plays, go back and look. When you're breaking down your film, go, man, can, can we play on on this one? Probably, maybe so. Uh, 
146 of the third, Matt. So now going back to previous discussions throughout what we've been talking about, this is one that if we do a better job earlier in the game of preventive officiating, not coaching, but preventive officiating, and we tell this number one, look, don't do that tonight. You're going to get offensive fouls. We may not have to call this foul because this one, he's been doing it a lot, and he, he probably – there's been a fewer previous instances that are probably a little bit more egregious than this one. But so what happens on this one at 148, if I'm not mistaken, I believe this is his fourth foul, all of which I think are offensive. But once again, going back to what I said earlier on a fourth foul, I would like it to be a little bit more. And that's why it's important that we use a little bit of uh, preventive officiating. We talk to him earlier in the game after he does the first one and say, Hey, don't do that tonight. You're going to get offensive fouls. Maybe, hypothetically, maybe, maybe not. But it will save us from having to make this like a little bit of a tweener fourth foul. He did it the whole game. So, like I said, I'm just saying so we can minimize the debate and the pushback from the coach. Like, oh, come on, really? Fourth foul? Now i got to take him out on that one? Whereas if we spoke up a little bit sooner, maybe we can prevent that, having to make that decision. 131. We have a 131, we have a violation on a three second. And I think it comes from, where does it come from? Oh, yeah, it comes from the league, comes from Clifford. Th this is one that, like I said, I I'm not gonna say it's, I mean, it's, it's, you can debate it, but here's the thing. We haven't introduced a three second violation throughout the whole entire game. So I know from, a, from, from where I like to be, if I'm going to throw a three second in there, it's they're camping in the key. And there's not a question of whether or not, does he have possession? Does he not have possession? Da, 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 da. It's just, it's going to call itself. So food for thought being, if you're going to introduce a three second violation into the game, let it call itself. 115, play this forward. Excellent, no call. Uh, yeah, 115, Matt, you can just play it. Uh, we got a question uh, over and back. Mark Nudler, over and back, 125. Can you, can you play that, Matt, 125? Let's talk about it. Okay, play it. Okay, play. If I'm not mistaken, we did call it over and back, did we not? Yeah, we did. I think that's an over and back call. Not a popular one, but I don't think he – backcourt, foot's in the backcourt. He's in the air when he establishes. So he has backcourt status. It's a pretty tight one, but it's defendable, just my opinion. Okay, uh, go to 706 of the fourth, Matt. Try and move this up here. Appreciate everybody hanging in there on their Friday night. <clears throat> um, so really the discussion I, I just wanted to have here at 706 is you can debate the back down here, whether or not that's an offensive, a flop. That's that could be another discussion. All I want to talk about here is just is the crew is just a general game awareness. We're in the fourth period, state championship game, three point game, seven oh six. We have a foul, and we get caught off guard here, and we we don't know that's our bonus situation. So, um, 
once again, that that's an instance where like with like an out of bounds play coming right out of the third period, or excuse me, right out of the intermission. Now we come out of the intermission between the third and the fourth period. And the first thing that happens is we get caught off guard with the bonus situation. So that's just, that's just dialing in that focus, that concentration. We come away. One of the last things we say when we come out, Hey, next one, next one is bonus. Next one is bonus. Uh, let's see. Five sixteen, Matt. I have. I, I think this is a good call. They'll show a replay. We got a block on the big kid, I believe, right? Protecting the shooter. I like the no call on the spin move. He's still kind of, he wants to do that reaching out, boy. He, I don't know if number one is a senior, junior, or whatever, but for all you individuals that have Hilliard next year, that's a pregame topic, you know. The one reason why I say is, you know, I like that we didn't put our fifth foul on number one for that one because he has a tendency to do that enough. He's probably going to give us another opportunity, which you will see he does. Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, go to 422. Here it is right here. Oh, no, this. Oh, yeah. And number one, fifth foul called itself, double whistle. Everybody sees it. It played into our hands, but it worked out well for us because I guarantee we would have got pushed back on that spin move, end line spin move as a fifth foul versus this one calls itself. That's a good fifth foul. Surprised he didn't get pick up an offensive foul for his fifth, though. Okay. All right. Uh, 315. Three fifteen. I mean, that's a point of emphasis. We had one of those earlier. You know what? If they don't want to comply and that wrap occurs like that, freedom of movement, we got to keep that throughout. Go 211 and 205. As soon as you find that mat, excuse me one sec. Sorry about that, six and a four-year-old for all you parents out there. So, seven to good sequence of no calls. I believe that's number 21. Come back the other end. This point in the game, man, we got a game. We got ourselves a game. I just like it's a good flow, good sequence, and no calls. So 127, go to 127. Okay, so. This is a play that that I know what we're doing here, and, and Steve, I commend you. Good cleanup foul. 
good job of getting this, getting this play. The only thing is we have to be careful here because when you blow your whistle, I think we could all agree that 35 is, is, is throwing up a shot. And I know the mindset or the conversation probably is, you know, you tell your partners, oh, hey, you know, uh, I, I, he, they fouled him earlier. I meant to blow it sooner. I should have blown it sooner or whatever we've all said in our career. But the tape don't lie on this one. And as you can see, when you blow your whistle, he's on the floor. Ball's already missed. We have to award a shooting foul on this one. Just by rule, I'm, well, I should be careful saying that. I'm assuming that the federation rule is the same as the NCAA collegiate rule. But this is a shooting foul. And now this is an opportunity for either Clifford or Javier to come in and go, hey, Steve, you probably wanted to blow that sooner. But when you blew your whistle, he was clearly in the shooting motion. So you want to award the, the free throws. And I think they're in the bonus. So he gets the bonus and he makes the first one. But this is a play that when you go back and if he misses that and they, they rebound and he doesn't get that second shot, that's a play that can come back to bite us. So that's just, just some awareness when, a, when your partner has a whistle, just no status of the ball and what we have going on because we're one minute and 27 seconds to go in a two-point game in the state final. Those two free throws are, are very, very important to Hilliard. So he goes for bonus. He makes the first one. I can't remember if he misses the second one, but just uh, um, good awareness. We, we want to have that awareness. Derek Newell just said without audio, it, it is hard to tell. I would just go without audio, even when he blows his whistle and pumps that fist, it's it's so late in the sequence that it it has to be a shooting foul. Um, okay, let's go to 49 seconds. So we have a jump ball. I like the jump ball. And then we have a technical foul. Now, without knowing anything what was said or, or anything like that, I will say this, is when Steve gives the technical foul, it wasn't very reactionary. It wasn't very animated. So I, I, I would give him the benefit of the doubt and say, you know, it, it wasn't um, – you know, it wasn't – didn't come out of nowhere and this and that. There was a little bit of emphasis to it, but it wasn't super reactionary. Now, if we can unmute Steve and and just, you know, hear his uh, version of what he was said, because I don't want to comment or speculate. It's just – it's such an important moment of the game. I, I think that – is Steve still on the call? Yeah, Steve is still here. Go ahead, Steve, if you want to kind of. Kyle. Yeah, Kyle, plus on that previous play, I'm, God, I'm 99% sure we gave him a two-shot foul on that. But on this call, okay. on this technical call, uh, it was so egregious what this kid said. I cannot repeat it on this call. <laughs> The only thing, the only really what I probably should have done, but it just the game situation didn't dictate it, was it should have been a flagrant technical. So I would tell, I would say what he said privately, but I will not say it on this recording. Fair enough, fair enough. And and if it's that egregious that you're not going to repeat it in front of, you know, 80 of your peers, then that kind of calls itself. Now, my question is, is did he say it to you or did he say it to the other kid or did he say it? He said loud? it to the, he said it to the other kid and all the kids knew exactly. He knew exactly. Okay. Uh, and, yeah. You know, to that, I say, you know, Hey, we're not in the business of saving players. And I could, I could go here and tell you any hey, 49 seconds to go in a tie ball game in the state final is if there were a tool in your tool belt to prevent yourself from having to call that technical, I'm sure we would find a way, but if he said it, so the eight or nine other kids on the floor, and it was egregious enough that it was pretty much could be deemed a flagrant, 
then as unfortunate as it is, it is what it is, you know, because I know a lot of people say, man, he could have said whatever about anybody and whoever and this and that, and I ain't giving him a technical foul. Well, that's not necessarily the case because if there is audio and it's that loud and there's a microphone by that basket and all of those kids hear what he said and it's that egregious, then you have to give him a technical foul because when it's that egregious, I mean, that's your integrity. They'll like going forward to next year and next year after that, I mean, or, or a coach, if they hear that and you didn't penalize that, then you don't have the, the stones to, to make that call. So, I mean, I commend you if, if it's that bad, then you know what it's, you know, if there was any way I would, you know, you probably have the experience to go, if there was any way you would love to not give it, I'm sure you would have found that way, you know? Yeah. I mean, situationally, that is just the absolute last, point you know in the game where you want to make that call but like I say I mean it was it was very egregious yeah and I mean and you want it to be you want it to be you know made or uh audio for tv like one of my bosses always says you know make sure your technicals uh make them for tv and when he announces to all those other kids what he said to that kid that that's kind of made for tv you know so um like I said we're not in the business of saving them when they when they make it that egregious you know that's your fault for picking 50 seconds to go to, to pipe off at that time. So, um, you know, now with, and like I said, before I even, you know, unmuted you and I said, Hey, what did he say? It's, you know, you didn't look like it was super emotional and you were just kind of like, Hey, I got to take care of business. So, um, you know, it's just, just interesting discussion. Cause, um, <laughs> I just, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that, uh, you know, he uh, picked that moment to, to uh, talk some smack, you know, um, you know, so going forward there, uh, I really, I mean, Matt, if you want to jump ahead to 34 seconds to go. Uh, one other question though, Steve, did, did the other kids say anything to him back or say anything that precipitated the kid for Hilliard saying what he said. Not that I heard. Not that I did not hear anything. Uh, no, he just no. Okay. Because and I would just say that's one of those things Double. that that if that is a tool in your tool belt that if something he uh, you know instigated it or was the you know precipitated it to make him say something back, then that's mm -hmm. where you would love to just go, you know what, that's a double technical foul. They were both talking smack, but if it's not even a remote possibility, then, you, you know, you got to do what you got to do. So, um, so now I just going forward from that play, we as a crew, and you guys did a nice job. It didn't rock the boat. It, it didn't throw us off our game. And, and uh, it didn't, um, you know, that I don't really think, you know, from what I saw, they're not going to hang anything on us is, is when you have a moment like that in a game and especially a game of this importance, you just got to calm yourself and go, okay. Realizing that, man, you just nailed Hilliard with a pretty tough call. And so going forward, if there's a 50, 50 call, we just got to make sure that we don't miss anything against Hawthorne because of situationally where we are. And like I said, you guys did a nice job. There was one play literally in the last 40 seconds of the game. There was a travel at 34.1. If, Matt, if you can jump ahead to that one. We have a travel here. And... I'll tell you what, I, I love this call right here because what I said, what I was just mentioning, some people are saying, the announcers, they really, they hated this call too. And they're like, oh, that's a foul. I don't know what, if that's not a foul, I don't know what it is. I got to tell you, it, it's tough to say, did he foul? Did he travel first? We can debate that all night long. Here's the thing. We just had a tough technical foul on Hilliard. I love this travel call. It just situationally, I think it is the best decision. I just like the call, and that's my opinion. Because if you call a blocking foul on 10, you better be ready to, to deal with some, some aggravation from the Hilliard bench. 
and it's close. It's a tweener. Does 10 impede? Maybe. Does does the Hawthorne kid drag the pivot foot? I, I just like the decision. And so now we go in the front court for the very next possession. Wait, go back to uh, 34.1, Matt. Did we jump ahead here? I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. So that very next decision, I, I just think that that did such a good job of kind of kind of wiping the slate clean a little bit with the technical foul. So I, I just think that was a good decision. So and then I watched the rest play out. And you know what? There was nothing down the stretch that they could hang their hat on. So, you know, in some, I, I think that, you know, hey, you guys, you did a good job. And, and you know, a state final game is definitely not an easy. I think we talked about some stuff as far as really, I think, as a whole, just for the crew and for all of us from, a, from the takeaway or a teaching point is, is to just be mindful of, of just slowing down our cadence a little bit and the buzz word being just, you know, withstand a little bit of that ugly in some of those plays at the basket especially with the more athleticism and more of what some of these players can do in terms of block shots and just defending is just put a half a click in your whistle and, and some of those will just allow you to, to play out a little bit more. Um, so that's, I mean, as far as the breakdown, that's, that's kind of how I do it for myself or when I'm breaking down with one of my mentors and stuff, we, we get after it in that way. Uh, Jeremy, if you want to open it up for any additional questions, dialogue, clarification, whatnot. Like I said, I really appreciate you guys hanging in there tonight on a Friday night, uh, setting aside some family and, and friend time to, to just chop it up. Yes, for sure, Kyle. Thank you uh, very much for taking the time away from your family as well to do this for us. Uh, and, and like you said, we appreciate all of those who, who joined us tonight. Hopefully this was very um, – informational for you um we we plan to do more like this uh, i know frank is still on uh he he was uh in this the whole time uh, and we've been chatting back and forth via text about how super cool this is so this is something we definitely look uh forward to continuing and doing more sports obviously uh, so i will open it up for questions um our panelists um if you want to put them in the chat that's fine as well uh, attendees, if you want to ask your questions in the Q&A box, um, we can go through those um, and uh, uh, we'll stay for maybe another 10, 15, 20 minutes, depending on how much time Kyle still has. Um, there was a question real quick I want to touch on as far as, as far as fouls to the head, Kyle. It was kind of earlier in the game. Um, if you want to touch on, if you don't mind, um, what you look for as far as fouls to, to or hits to the head. Um, when they are a foul, when they aren't a foul. Um, if you want to start off with that, um, we, can, we can start there. Sure. And uh, I forgot to mention one thing, too. If anybody wants, like, a, a little bit more in-depth clarification or explanation or whatever, and, and you care enough to, to kind of have that dialogue, Jeremy has my email contact information, and, and you can get that from him and shoot me an email. And um, I'm really good about getting back on emails. It might be a few days, but I, I won't leave you hanging. Like I said, I'm a referee junkie, so we can get some good dialogue going. Uh, place to the head. You know what? We don't have as much latitude and, and flexibility on those. And so, you know, when it comes to, to contact to the head and stuff, uh, I still, even though if there is the contact and it's a brush by the head and stuff, and there's not as much of a, um, a snapping of the head or something, this and that, I still will try and lay off those. But keeping in mind what I just said is when there is contact to the head, our latitude to what to do with those plays, I think it shrinks as far as making a decision more so and just making a call. I mean, it's, they're more black and white, you know. So I don't know if that answered the question. But as far as, like I said, if it's a brush by brush and there's no – and the other thing is these kids are getting really good at embellishing too. Like if there's any type of, 
movement towards their head. They're going to snap their head and do this. But that also goes into, you know, talking with your fellow officials and doing some, some, uh, you know, some intel on your, and your personnel and knowing like uh, maybe like number 10 for, for Hawthorne seemed to be on the floor a lot, you know, and we have players in our game that they embellish that contact and oh watch them. They're a head snapper. And, you know, so that just comes with seeing some of the same teams more than once or twice. Awesome. Thank you, Fred. Uh, I know you kind of asked that question. Um, does that kind of help you um, differentiate between uh, calls and non-calls? Actually, actually, it does. Uh, um, I've just, for the last year, I've been, that's one, I, I've been trying to work on the things that just exactly what he was talking about, being a lot more patient with my whistle. That was kind of like my main thing going into last season. And um, I did notice that um, a couple of times I, I saw a hit to the head, but I didn't call it because I didn't think it was like an egregious hit. He wasn't trying to do it. The, the, uh, the, the offensive player actually ran into an elbow and caused a big knot on his head. And, you know, and it wasn't the defender's fault. He just had his arms straight up in the air. So, and then that's when the coach said to me, hit him in the head. How are you going to call that? And that's the way I explained it to him. It's just that he had his hands in the air and your and your offensive player ran into his elbow. So but that that definitely helped clarify it for me. Thank you very much. And you know what, like to just kind of snatch a couple of your comments, like, you know, oftentimes I just when there's a coach dialogue, I find myself a lot, you just you just say to the coach, Coach, what did the defender do wrong? And you just said that the coach said, Well, he ran into his arm, and I'm like they kind of incriminated his player more than he did the defender. Yeah. He coach, I agree with you. He ran into a legal defender's arm and then just don't say anything else, you know? So it's just, it's, it's semantics, but it is, it's true. Like the defender was there. He was legal and the offensive player ran in to a legal defender and it just so happened he got a knot on his head. Well, that goes back to one of my fundamental comments. What did the defense do wrong? So uh, I think we have another question here um, from Chad. Uh, Kyle, do you have any advice on how to build credibility and or deal with coaches? Uh, uh, yeah. Understanding that it, it takes time, Chad. I mean, it's, it takes repetition. It takes familiarity. It um, takes a very receptive style of communication. I know that I work with uh, um, some officials in the Northwest in terms of um, some training stuff and this and that. And one of the things we just discussed recently was is that some of the younger generation of officials is that there's this uh, um, it's, it's not a very receptive communication. It's more like a, a snarky kind of, you know, back and forth and this and that. And, you know, it takes time to, to do that, to have that experience. And as well as you know the rule book, as well as you know your mechanics, you know, it's still the best way to do that is with um, repetition with having that same coach a few times. Another thing is getting your plays right. Another huge one to me is having the humility to say when you get your plays wrong. And for some people, that's really, really hard. And it doesn't always have to be, coach, I missed that play. There's plenty of ways to say, to give a coach some empathy and go, coach, you got a great point on that one. Uh, you know what? That'll be one of the first ones I look at on the tape. There's plenty of ways to, you know, give credibility to that coach's complaint, not throw yourself under the bus, but also be receptive to say, I'm not perfect. I, I you know, I'm, I'm fallible too. I, I, I make mistakes. And, and when you're in your younger part of your earlier part of your career and stuff, that just, that to me is, is a huge piece is having that humility to go that like, I mean, uh, on any given night, I try and shoot for really high accuracy too, but there are some darn tough plays out there and, you know, you're, you're going to miss some plays and 
here's the other thing is with all the transparency and with all the, the technology today, the ta we, we've said in the industry for years, the tape don't lie. And that coach, he's going to go back to his house at that night because it's his livelihood and he's going to get in front of his TV and his, you know, his DVR and he's going to play that game back and he's going to think about that call you told him, oh, coach, it happened this way. I, I know it happened this way. I saw it this way. And he's going to replay it back and go, what? And that's just, that's just not right. That's crazy. Look, I'm looking at it right there. That's not what happened at all. So you know what? It, it's, you just got to recognize that have that transparency, have that humility. You also, like I said, though, you, you want to try and be as accurate as possible because, you know, we, we still are in the business of getting plays right, you know? So as far as establishing credibility, I think that's, that's one thing. And, you know, it's, it's a, becomes more and more important every year is just uh, looking the part, you know, being in shape, being ready to go, looking good in that uniform. That, that says a lot before you even blow your whistle for the first time on any given night. The first time a, a coach ever sees you is, is, it is what it is. They, they judge us, you know, the minute we walk out there. Awesome. Uh, we have any more questions or, or anything from any of the panelists or attendees? Um, if not, would Javier or Steve, I know you guys are still on, would you like to say anything um, to, to Kyle or to the group or just in general? Um, kind of give you guys the opportunity to, to maybe say something if, if you want about uh, having your, your, your game film looked at. Um, I will. Uh, Javier and Steve, this is Frank Beasley from FHSA. I appreciate you guys having thick skin and allowing us to uh, work through this. What a great uh, basketball game it was. And it was uh, a bunch of great athletes on the floor, but it, it seemed like a really tough game to uh, work through. But I appreciate you guys, and we all thought you did a great job. And, and obviously, we could sit and watch any game and, and critique officials uh, throughout the entire contest. But I do appreciate Kyle for, um, you know, showing the good and the not so good and the way areas that we can get better. And just to everybody, uh, thank you to Jeremy for putting this on, putting this together. Uh, we're so excited about the future of where we're going. And one of the positives of the pandemic, which aren't many, is that we've learned so much about technology uh, that we are going to begin to utilize these uh, these uh, platforms to do way more training and house this stuff for for all of our officials to see. So, Kyle, we appreciate you so much. I'm glad that you and Jeremy have developed a relationship, and we can't thank you enough. And um, who is running the video? Um, you know, props to a very good friend of mine, Matt. Yeah. Matt. Matt and I work together at the division one level and uh, he is a, my resident tech expert. And uh, Matt, thank you. I, we appreciate you too. And it's amazing awesome. how well do you guys work together? <laughs> yeah, we work kind of, uh, we work together in several different fronts. And so, uh, and you know, last I, you know, Frank, I echo what you said, you know, Steve and Javier and Clifford, even though he's not on the call, you know, congratulations, man. State final is, is a, thing to put on the your career mantle and uh, they can never take it away from you and you know you guys did do a good job because at the end of the day I, I think like relatively 10 players and two coaches were relatively happy and uh, you know I mean that's that's what we strive for and and to like he, uh, Frank said I know you guys didn't really have a choice in it it was just happened to be the game I picked but you know to open yourself up for that kind of critique and everything uh, it, it for those individuals who do that it it, it's only going to make you be better, you know, and, and uh, you know, obviously you guys are doing a lot of things right because you don't get, they don't hand out state tournament or state final games to, to anybody. So, you know, for other people on the call, uh, you know, Steve and Javier, they, they've got a wealth too of, of knowledge and experience that, uh, you know, uh, pick their brains as well. Cause like I said, a state final is no small accomplishment. So, so props to you guys. Kyle, we have another question from Sean Johnson. Uh, can you suggest some camps you know that may actually be happening this summer? Uh, you know what? Sorry, Sean. It's six o'clock. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm. It's beer third. No, I'm just kidding. You know, what, Sean. Uh, I, I have a wealth of camps I can direct you, and I know you know you guys are all in Florida. I live in Arizona. Matt lives in Oregon. Um, you know. I myself and Matt were involved uh, with a lot of camps uh, as, as, as far as instructing, as far as 
we have an app that helps facilitate camps, but really this, this summer is an anomaly. I, I, you know, we're just monitoring what the CDC is saying. Um, I mean, as it right now, there's so many of these camps are on hold. I was supposed to be in Edmonton this weekend for a camp and, uh, you know, there's some coming up at the end of the month. We're still waiting to hear. Um, Matt and I have a, uh, a camp up in uh, Portland, Oregon around the 4th of July that's affiliated with Nike that is honestly near and dear to my heart. Uh, it was started by uh, Penny Davis, who is the national coordinator of uh, women's officials or women's NCAA. Um, she started it, and uh, that's always been one of my absolute favorites. Um, and I have the connections throughout the – um, you know, the Midwest and some East Coast to, to direct people towards camps that I think are really good in terms of teaching and not just taking money and, and indentured servitude where you're out there working five, seven, eight games a day. That, that's not productive at all. So, um, but as far as, you know, actual specific recommendations, you know, get my email from uh, Jeremy and, you know, when the dust settles with the pandemic and everything, and we see if, if, and what camps will take place, I, I will do my best to specifically recommend or put you in touch with somebody else that might be in close, you know, closer geographic proximity to, you know, to, to put you at a right camp because, you know, there's, there's so many of these camps out there and some of them are just much better at really providing you with the quality, uh, you know, education and stuff. So, but yeah, and we're just kind of waiting to see too. Um, hopefully it, uh, we can get some, back to some sense of normalcy, maybe mid, mid to late June, possibly July. Um, you know, shoot, I'm Matt and I were just talking the other day. I, uh, we hope the basketball season starts on time, end of October and early November. So, you know, I think all of us are ready for some sports to get back uh, going. Uh, on with that, Kyle, if you don't mind, I could also just shoot you an email periodically and get a, a running list, and then we can post that for our officials, um, and we can kind of go that way so you're not answering 40, 50 emails um, with the same camps, and we can just leave, keep a running post if you don't mind doing it that way. Yeah, sure. Uh, and then they can look through our FHSA Central Hub or, or an email from us reminding them of those camps if, if you want to go that route as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm for whatever is the easiest route to put in the information in the hands of as many of your officials as possible because, you know, it's just anybody who knows me, I'm about giving back. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of people along the way that helped me in all of this. So, and that's, uh, you know, and I surround myself with a lot of like-minded individuals. And, um, yeah, there's there's some great camps. And you know what? I mean, we'll be happy to have some, some people fly all the way from Florida out to the West coast. Cause it's, uh, you know, anymore, it, it doesn't matter with, uh, as you move up the chain at, uh, that geography, uh, gets less and less, uh, preventative, the higher you go. So it's, and it's good. I mean, Matt can say the same thing, you know, I've traveled out to the East coast uh, several times in my career just to get a fresh look and get some fresh information. So it's, uh, you know, it's definitely a, a good idea. Very good, very good. Well, I, I don't have any more questions. Um, so unless there's any others, it's kind of for right now, forever, hold your peace. We're running uh, approximately a little over two hours. Um, so Kyle, Matt, uh, thank you guys again for, for helping us out and speaking to our officials uh, and to our officials here in Florida. Thank you for joining us. Uh, like Frank and I have said, we're we're excited for, for holding these and continuing to do these. So um, we'll keep everybody in the loop. And uh, we all hope that your families and yourself are, are safe and healthy. Um, and, and good night. And uh, stay safe, guys. Thanks again. Everybody stay, stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, Matt. Hey, my Thanks, pleasure. Kyle. Thanks for your time.